We have something interesting for you today. This is a World War II radio. This was the first walkie-talkie. As sometimes people call the BC-611 the walkie-talkie, but that was a handy-talkie. This radio was carried on the back uh, of the soldier, like a backpack, and uh, it allowed the soldiers to communicate over a distance of about five to ten miles depending on what antenna was used in the terrain. It is a self-contained radio unit. It consists of the uh, BC-1000 transceiver and there is a battery compartment here which would contain a battery that's actually even bigger than the radio and where most of the weight was coming from. So the top section is really the, the radio itself. It's part of the SCR-300 radio installation and like I said the transceiver is called the BC-1000. This radio was extensively used uh, during D-Day, 1944-1945 uh, is really when they uh, uh, became available in large volumes to the uh, US military and it has been used after the war all the way into Korea and in certain European armies, especially the French it was used all the way into the 70s and the nice thing about that is that the friends developed some power supplies for it because the batteries were almost impossible to get at that point and I'll show you that later when we're gonna turn this radio on now you know me in our channel in this channel I only show you radios that work we're not uh, uh, just showing them as cosmetic items no matter how esoteric the radio and no matter how old we will always show you a working radio on this channel originally unmodified working radio um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, controls here pretty straightforward obviously we have an input for the microphone and we have an input for the phone and that together goes into this uh, horn now this is not the original horn for it but this is the only one I had and it works fine this is a more modern one the original one looks like a literally like a telephone horn the old ones um, we have uh, volume control uh, we have frequency adjust this radio is a uh, true transceiver it has a uh, frequency dial calibrated in channels that covers frequency from 40 to 48 megahertz which was unique this was the first military radio that used that band and there were no other radios I'm not sure that even the Germans were listening on it the other interesting thing about this is that the radio was um, frequency modulated first one to do so for a portable radio there were portable radios that were AM super regenerative radios primitive this one is highly sophisticated it was way ahead of its time so there is a one dial adjustment and that's it it tunes everything frequency antenna you name it uh, there is a squelch that was another unique thing many radios that came later did not have that this radio has a squelch and it works quite well which I will show you later this is a calibration button for instance if you go to channel 38 there you see the calibration 36 37 uh, by pressing that you can calibrate this dial to be exactly on that frequency and then the other channels will be correct as well there is uh, room for an additional speaker or an additional headset if someone else wanted to listen in and this is the uh, antenna the antenna is basically a uh, a loaded coil antenna, a short antenna and uh, this particular one is actually brand new, was never used there is also a long antenna if longer distances had to be bridged but this one is for distances between two three miles the radio is about half a watt if the battery is fresh once the battery gets older it goes down to 300 250 milliwatts um, this particular one, believe it or not was used on the uh, battleship USS Casson Young. That ship still exists as a museum ship, but uh, uh, 
this was actually used on the on that particular ship you were wondering why are navy ships using uh, uh, army man pack radios the reason was navy had no radios that could handle this frequency navy radios were always built like a tank reliable but the technology was relatively primitive and this radio is far from primitive even today I find it f quite sophisticated uh, the concepts that were used so if the Navy had to talk to troops uh, uh, on land they used uh, 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 basically army radios to do that and this BC-1000 uh, was used as such on the uh, USS Cassignon as I said which ship uh, was manufactured I think came into service in 1943 and uh, like I said you can still visit this as a uh, as a, uh, a museum ship all right so maybe what we should do is open this up and uh, show you a little bit more on the inside okay as you can see I've separated the actual radio from the battery box you can see the battery box is actually bigger than the radio itself like I said earlier this is where the battery would go in and then this would plug onto that battery which is at the, uh, the bottom of the radio this strap would be used to tie the battery to the uh, to the radio so that the weight would not be entirely carried by uh, by these clips um, the, ra the, battery, the radio takes uh, four and a half for a second, it takes four and a half volts for the uh, uh, filaments. It uses mini miniature tubes directly heated, one and a half volts each. So they put a series of threes in series, and then the uh, filament voltage would be four and a half volts basically from, uh, from uh, standard batteries. And the high voltage would be 90 volt for the receiver and 150 volts for the transmitter and that would get you a full days of power uh, not more than that I would say also dependent of course on how much talk there would be uh, so you need high voltage batteries and obviously those are not uh, uh, easy to get anymore unless you make them yourself but we'll show you later how we are going to power this radio because I told you we're going to actually demonstrate it to you in a real point-to-point uh, -point, uh, uh, setup where we talk to another station. We took the radio out of its case again by unclipping these uh, six clips and now we have the radio in open condition and uh, let's close this for a second this can be closed and show you the whole thing a little bit better this is a ganked capacitor with five or six sections I think six um, like I said it's a transceiver so that's used for both receive and transmit we uh, basically enter the uh, RF stage here if I'm not mistaken yeah this is the uh, preamp for the uh, receiver uh, this is the uh, oscillator section we go to a mixer which is here and then first amp first IF I should say and here we go to uh, a second IF the first IF is 4.3 megahertz the second IF is in the uh, 2 megahertz range this is the crystal that is used to go from first IF to second IF it's high injection mixing 6815 kilohertz and here we have the crystal 4.3 megahertz 4300 kilohertz which is used as the sidestep oscillator for the transmitter so the actual VFO frequency is uh, used for both the receiver and the transmitter for the receiver it gets us to 4.3 megahertz IF for the transmitter we mix this against the uh, VFO signal to get back to uh, the actual working frequency on the 40 megahertz band like I said here we go through all the IF stages uh, this here together with that one is the discriminator the FM discriminator and um, 
this together is the discriminator coils. I think this this uh, maybe this I might be wrong is the squelch that uses three tubes for the squelch circuit, which you can turn off to conserve uh, uh, battery. But if you turn on the squelch, then three additional tubes are coming on, and that will result in a little bit shorter battery life. Pay a price for everything. Uh, this these are the transmitter tubes. So this turns on the mixer. Uh, a 3A4 uh, a tube when you want to transmit. This is the uh, PA tube. PA is a big word. Like I said, the thing gives off uh, 500 milliwatt best case and that's another 3A4 tube. And that's really it. Now it's built very well. This plugs in the back of this case and that then plugs to this again. It's on that storm plugs into the battery. It is uh, exceptional well built. The fact that this thing is still around 75 years later, if not more, says a lot. I'm going to show you the uh, underside. Not too heavy. This is the underside of the radio, typical chassis build up, but pretty clean. Main cable here that uh, branches out to everything. These are the uh, what I told you the five, one two three yeah five stages for the ganked variable capacitor. Now one thing that I uh, did to make this radio work, this radio uses uh, these kind of capacitors for um, for bypassing. There are uh, ten nanofarad capacitors. Almost all of them were gone, leaky which was the reason why the radio didn't work anymore and I actually had to replace 40 of them I think it was 40 in total uh, they were all bad some worse than others but the result was that the radio didn't work, work anymore so I did put new capacitors in there which will make this radio last for um, for another 75 years if not more but uh, that was the one thing so that's the reason why you don't see too many of these radios working because they're all gonna have that problem it depends a little bit on who the supplier was in those days. Some suppliers might have been better than others. This one obviously had a bad capacitor supplier because they were literally all gone. And uh, in order to make the radio work, you will have to replace those. Now, without tooting my horn too much, I'm very good at that. But it is a hard, hard, hard job. This is not for the faint of heart. Because some of these capacitors are extremely difficult to get to. So that's why so many of these radios are sitting on shelves without actually working. Still a nice, uh, a nice discussion piece, but uh, but I want my radios working. So this one is 100% fixed and works completely according to the specifications when it was manufactured for both the receiver and the transmitter. But uh, like I said, that's the underside. Now how we're going to make this radio work? Is, uh, is a little bit of a, uh, a challenge almost. Here I have what's called a TM217. If you look in the manual for this radio, which can be downloaded from the internet, you will see what this is for. This is for using an external antenna. And the way it works is you screw it in. Fits in the uh, antenna socket here. And the antenna socket obviously was designed for uh, high impedance antennas, whips and stuff. This little device brings that down to 50 ohms. Got to ground this strap here. And this allows me now to use my external antenna. I'm still able to tune that at 48 megahertz. It's a web antenna. And that allows me to uh, reach the other fellow, which is about 5 miles away from here. So uh, on the internal antenna that probably would not have worked, but when I use an external antenna, outdoor antenna, I make a uh, much better chance of doing that. So this is the first step. We're using this little device to go to 50 ohms so we can use external antennas, which is, by the way, it also was used in the Army. Uh, if you look in the manual uh, that you can download, you will see that there was a, a ground plane antenna for that purpose, which would be mounted on a treetop, and then with the coaxial cable you would connect it to this little device, and you would be able to connect over much, much larger distances. Now the other thing we're going to do is hook it up to a power supply. I have this power supply here. It is a uh, 
French built power supply that works at 24 volts vehicle power supply for the BC1000 which, which basically turns the radio into a VRC3 which is the nomenclature for that configuration here you see the top as you can see this goes onto the plug the battery plug for the uh, for the radio that showed you earlier here we see the uh, the ID plate from 1952 so it was made later this is where the 24 volts goes in and this is what we have here now the radio is uh, a vibrator power supply um, that there were actually two vibrators in there one is spare one is the one that's used and they didn't work anymore so I had to uh, uh, modify those to a solid state vibrator because both of the even the never used one didn't work anymore and for that we got a uh, RVB2 from uh, Peco which I built in here and that is uh, running the show here I did make a nice label on there to show that it's actually a silent vibrator that people don't think there's something wrong with these things because they don't make any noise this is the transformer this is the uh, filament rectifier because the filament comes from the transformer once the radio is running these are the uh, diode rectifiers for the uh, the output of the transformer and of course here are some uh, additional relays and stuff if you really want to see how this works if you look at the VRC American the VRC3 American power supply I think it's PP114 it works identical but that one can handle three input voltages this is the same design but set for only uh, uh, for only 24 volts so that's what we're going to use for our uh, supplying our BC1000 here you see the thing completely uh, in its case nice uh, and compact actually the same size as the battery so I could fit it in the uh, bottom case but uh, then you would have to drill a hole in the case with a 24 volt and I'm not going to do that of course so we will test this uh, outside the battery case and plug directly into our uh, BC1000 all right we got uh, we got the whole thing set up what we have here is the BC1000 connected to a speaker so I can let you hear better what's going on of course we still got our handset that didn't change the output of the uh, of the TM217 adapter is going to this uh, SVR bridge, SWR bridge. That on its turn is going to my outside antenna to a uh, through a coaxial switch. We got the power supply, the VRC3 power supply here. Plug in, you can see it very well. It's in the case right now, and we got that hooked up to the uh, power supply that you see here. Uh, we're drawing about. 400 milliamps on receive and we are at 28 volts for the um, for the transceiver for the power supply here we have uh, a monitor receiver FT817 at 48 megahertz and we got the transceiver at uh, 48 megahertz at channel 40 which corresponds to 48 megahertz we do have the Skrelts in. Skrelts is out now. Um, I did calibrate the radio. I can do that again. Okay. Zero beat. And we are at Cal. I don't know if that's visible for that uh, calibration signal, which is crystal controlled, by the way. And then we have our channel 40, which corresponds to 48 megahertz. The antenna is uh, reasonably in tune. Well, I am at the dummy load right now. 
One, two, three, four, five. So this is with the horn. One. One, two, three, four, five. This is the uh, BC one thousand transmitting. One, two, three, four, five. Frequency modulation. And this is what comes back. One, two, three, four, five. Now the radio is obviously narrow band. One, two, three, four, five. So the volume isn't too high. One, two, three, four, five. The other problem is, of course, this radio gives only two milliwatt audio power out, so don't expect miracles from the speaker. But as you see, the setup is working. If I switch to my outside antenna, which is what we know, noise increases a bit. The VSWR is a little bit off. It's not bad. One, two, three, four, five. So this is just this is just uh, from the BC1000 to the ham radio. But like I said, this is such a unique radio that we're going to do a. Uh, we're gonna do a real conversation with the station that's about, well, I don't know, three, four miles away from here. Maybe five. All right, so uh, let's uh, set that up and have a real radio connection with this radio. All right, here we have our setup again for the BC-1000. I think I hadn't shown you that label yet. And let's see what we're going to get here. SCR 300 calling SEM 35. SCR 300 calling SEM 35. Are you listening over? Yes, M35 copy well, 5x9 I would say, 5x9. How do you copy uh, my signal over? Roger, SM35, good to hear things work well. Let's see how far I can turn in the squelts on this radio. Uh, uh, can you talk for a while over? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Quite a lot actually. Um, that uh, that works. Uh, no problem. Um, so I think I'll leave the squelch active on the BC one thousand here uh, to uh, get rid of the noise. I have a question actually. Do you do you use the uh, SEM thirty five radio right now, or is it the RT sixty eight transceiver? What are you using over? All right, okay, but the power for that radio is much lower than the RT68. What is it, one watt, if I remember correct, over? Uh, 735 returning. Uh, yes, you're correct. Uh, somewhere between one to two watts, depending on the frequency. How much does the BC1000 have on the RT68? Uh, what is the frequency? Over? SCR. 300 returning. I think it's a bit over 500 milliwatt. I am running it off the VRC3 power supply right now, so it definitely is not less than 500 milliwatt over. And 35 returning. Uh, I thought a BC1000 was only specified for 300 
SCR 300 for SEM35, well the technical manual is a bit cryptic about that. The general specification talks about 300 milliwatt, but in another section of the TM it says 500 milliwatt. I think 300 milliwatt is, on ever, is for average battery power, battery voltage. The 500 milliwatt is for a fresh battery. But I'm running it off the vehicle power supply, so the set is getting the best possible voltages right now equivalent to a fresh battery so that's why I thought 500 milliwatt is probably closer to reality over. Uh, well it's a number of voltages it's four and a half volts for the filament at one and a half, one and a half amp max it's 90 volts for the receiver section at 25 milliamps and 150 volts for the transmitter stages at 55 milliamp. Remember it uses uh, miniature battery tubes that run off one and a half volt filament voltage but the set has groups of three of these tubes in series. That's where the four and a half, four and a half volt filament specification comes from. It's not like the radio uses some weird four and a half volt tubes or whatever over. Yes, yeah, M35, I'm quite familiar with it. I have one here too. But uh, it's almost a bit too modern for my taste, with the emphasis on almost HI. Come on, you're not that old, are you? Uh, the M35 was developed in the early 60s. I would not call that modern. But you are right, of course. I cannot read a 3000 radio that was made in 1944. I grant you that. Over. Sam 35, Roger that. How does the modulation sound for this BC 1000 over? Sounds quite well, uh, CR 300. That rig works uh, excellent. Hard to believe it is uh, 76 years old. I guess the people who originally designed it are all gone by now, but they sure did a good job. Um, it was designed by um, uh, Gelfin, current uh, Motorola, if memory serves me right. Over. Yes, uh, Sam 35, that is correct. Designed by Galvin in 1942 in a very short time from concept to production. All using nothing but paper and slide rulers and their widths, of course. An excellent design, way ahead of its time. The first portable FM manpack radio, and now together with the BC611 Handy Talkie, the most famous World War II radios in existence. That's why we call that generation the greatest generation. But I think I told you uh, I did have to replace all 10 nanofarad bypass capacitors in this radio to get it to work again. A uh, total of 40 of them. They were all leaking DC current, some more than others, but uh, all bad. Uh, but I got it to work to factory specifications now, both receiver and transmitter over. Yeah, I see our 300 for SEM35. Yeah, I had noticed that too. The fact that the caps go bad in this radio also might have something to do with that. That's why there are so very few working BC1000s left, I think. I don't think the average ham is capable of replacing those, given how hard it is to reach the, reach the bad caps. 
and considering the abysmal solder skills I've seen from the Everett's ham. With soldering it's like driving a car, Everybody, everyone thinks of themselves as being a good driver. But then I wonder where are all those accidents coming from if you get my drift over. CR300 for SM35, yeah, we all know about those. Well, I thank you for trying this out. Good to see my BC1000 is up and running again. The old lady gets a clean bill of health. So have a good one there, and talk to you soon again. SCR300 signing off. Alright people, that was it. The BC-1000 uh, radio, the SCR-300 radio installation. This one from the USS Cassin Young. And uh, one of the only, I think the only video that actually showed is the radio in operation. ID plate, you see it has a uh, 44 date, 1944. And it's in, uh, in good shape, actually. And works nice. Thank you for, uh, for watching this video.